Howdy folks, Anthony Dream Johnson here, founder of 21 Studios with another episode of Gender Wars. Today in studio at 21 Studios in Orlando, Florida, I have the one and only Elliot Hulse, CEO of Strength Camp, uh, in here from Tampa, or St. Pete. Thanks for coming out, man. My pleasure. Love to oh, be yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Love what you're doing. Thanks, man. Yeah, man. Love what you're doing too and love uh, having you involved. Yep. You know, I met you uh, earlier this year, but uh, maybe a month and a half ago now or something like that. And I didn't know what to make of you uh, or what to expect going in. Mm -hmm. And I've been really impressed, man, from just hanging out, shark fishing, shooting guns, uh, filming, you know, podcasts and stuff. I've been really impressed, man. After following your work for many years on YouTube with Strength Camp and all that. Yeah. So it's nice to have you. It's more than nice to have you involved. It's fucking badass. Yeah. Perfect timing also, too. Yeah. And, you know, depend, depending on when you would have met me, your opinion may have been different. <laughs> Because there, same, there same. are lots of different, right, of course. I guess yeah. we're all evolving, you know? Yeah. And so it's uh, perfect timing for us to get together in this particular way because the work that you're doing has, just this year, really, has started becoming really important to me. Yeah. You know, I've gone, uh, being a pro strongman, strength coach, all the things that I've done led me to a place in life where I needed to back off a little bit yeah. and have some regrouping time. And then as that, moment for re-emerging came about i started to notice a trend in a lot of the the young men that were following me the questions that they were get they were sending yeah, yeah. had a lot to do with uh mig tau and red pill and no fap and these were things that i had never even really heard of prior to mig tau red pill no fap <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean all i spoke about until that point was you know lifting being strong yeah. being healthy i answered questions that were related to relationships and stuff like that just based on my experience but yeah. i've i haven't dated since i was 14 years old yeah so it's all kind of new you married your, look to you guys you know to get to gather some input so yeah. i could support my fans and you married your high school sweetheart right yes i did yeah and mm -hmm. that's a hell of a story man that's, that's something yeah. that seemed i think common a while ago and you don't hear that very often hunter though hunter drew a friend of ours is someone who's done that too mm -hmm. yeah well, yeah, it's good having you in the studio, man. I wanted to talk today about patriarchy and the upcoming event we have, which, as you know, is the first ever event we've done focused on fatherhood and patriarchy and marriage and family. And I think as we've talked about too privately, uh, I started this company 12 years ago, and it was a company focused on young men. It was literally called the Under 21 Convention. So seeing it come of age now, bringing in speakers like you who are older and you have this huge YouTube channel, and then we're talking about fatherhood and family and all these, like, very mature topics. It's a big, um, it's a big change since the founding. But for me, like we talked about too, it's like it's an evolution. It's very natural, and I'm excited to have fathers like you speak, patriarchs. Because like I, I, you said too, on our shark fishing trip we went on um, a few weeks ago, you said something important that anybody can be a parent or a father. Mm. You just go out, you get laid, you have sex, you get the chick gets knocked up, you pop out a baby, but that doesn't make you a strong father. It doesn't make you a patriarch. It doesn't make you a leader. Those are things you have to do. And I think you've done a good job on your channel with Strength Camp teaching men how to be strong in very specific physical ways and mental ways too mm -hmm. that are you know very tied in. So let me ask you this question. What do you think the relation is between fatherhood and physical strength? Like how does that play? Like why is it important if it's important? And uh, how does that affect your family? How does it affect your children over time? One of my favorite quotes from Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson is... Uh, what you are speaks so loud that the world can't hear a word you're saying. Damn. Yeah. So, you know, we could spend all of our time. We live in a day and age where talking is the, is the currency. Everybody speaks. Everybody has an idea. Really, what everybody's doing is regurgitating because information is so plentiful yeah. that they just take it in and spit it back out. What really moves someone's soul, you know, and I'm talking about, you know, father and his family, because that's really what we are, uh, is who you're being. And if you're being weak, also, I like to say your body is your mind. If you look weak, hmm. you're, you're, you're reflecting a weakness of character. If you're unhealthy, you're weak. So bodily Bodily vigor, bodily fitness, bodily strength uh, is a reflection of the soul. And you say, I'm, I'm imagining you would say, too, it's an expression of who you are, right? Yeah, your essence. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I recently started reading a lot of uh, Christian Orthodox books. Okay. I've been into all kinds of different religion and stuff. You yeah. know, I, just, I love this stuff. Uh, and I, Christianity, I put, a, put aside for a little while. Uh, and then recently, it's just kind of popped back up in my heart. 
but particularly Eastern Orthodox because of what I've discovered, the way they embody Christianity rather than just talking about it. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the, the fathers, one of the patriarchs, they, like, they call their leaders patriarchs. I love it. That's awesome. Uh, they write these old, there's, you know, an old text where they would give their wisdom. And, uh, and a lot of their work revolves around the fact that we cannot separate the physical manifestation and experience of a human being from the spiritual a lot of the uh a lot of the catholic and then uh protestant religions you know or branches of christianity separate the two and almost denigrate the body yeah right and forget that the body is the body is divine as well well let's let's change topics to this a little bit so why isn't fatherhood valued today the same way it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago we're talking about an old religion here, Eastern Orthodox, you know, Christianity. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. let's focus on America. Like, why has that changed? A big part of it is what we would call women's suffrage or progress for women, mm -hmm. which has brought women into the workforce, which takes them out of the home, but then also uh, reduces the necessity to have a provider, to have a, yeah. have a man. And so the whole idea that I don't need no man yeah. didn't exist <laughs> before that. It's like, no, you needed a man. So, uh, you know, the, I guess you could call it like the, the economic liberation hmm. of women, which I'm not against. I'm not a these aren't, you know, bad things. But when you ask the question, why aren't fathers as important? Yeah. Well, you've got that. And then you also have a government that... Uh, it's plain daddy. That, yeah, like will give prizes to women who don't have the, the father in the home, you yeah. know? So like the welfare state is dependent on having a woman with only her children dependent on the state. If the man is there, they don't get those, that, those free stuff and those yeah. prizes. So those are just, you know, some of the most obvious reasons why. Something comes to mind too, based on what you said, I agree with you that, you know, it's not a bad thing for women to uh, have the option and then sometimes make that option to, make a choice and have a career, build a career, or even something similar to that, start a business or whatever. But I think what you're getting at, because people will see that and I think they'll try to attack you for that. Right. But what I see is like choices have consequences. And right. that is what I think was lost in the sauce over the past 50, 60, 70, 80 years in this country with women, you know, going out in the workforce, leaving the home and not thinking about, for example, like getting taxed on that money. Whereas women used to stay home and of course not get taxed on being a housewife, being a mm -hmm. mother, uh, doing all those chores around the house that otherwise you have to spend money on. And they right. go out, of course, and get taxed and then contributes to the tax, ba tax base and all that. All sorts of conspiracy theories for that shit, too. But right. the basic facts are, yeah, things are things are changing. And you know, Hunter Drew is actually going to have a talk, I think, at some point at our conference that choices have consequences. Right. That's going to be the, to the whole title of it. Yeah, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing, or I'm not judging yeah. it. But, like you say, there are consequences. Yeah. And if you look at the those who benefit most from those consequences it's uh a lot of the corporations and government you know our yeah. our rulers they're the ones who benefit by more taxes more customers yeah. and more children that are not guided by their family and family values mm. but more now by the state and the media so it's really it's a it's a control issue it's it's earth supping power from the home mm. turning more human beings into batteries for the state and hypnotizing the family to be better consumers and followers yeah yeah the government's also a useful tool that for feminists and you know that kind of uh that kind of those ideas to break up the family right uh, no fault divorce laws and women getting you know getting 98 percent of alimony and all these crazy things You've seen, you know, even now you look at billionaires getting hosed, uh, yeah. Jeff Bezos and all these other guys, Brad Pitt got divorce raped. I mean, all this stuff, it's crazy. And that's all enabled by government, you know? Mm -hmm. um, let's, speaking of government, so you recently, uh, you know, came out as a pro-Trump supporter, at least as far as I've been able to tell on social media, mm -hmm. that's caused like a lot of ruckus, obviously, mm -hmm. and that's been, that's been actually a really interesting to follow. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think Trump's effect on fatherhood is in this country? currently over the past couple of years and now 
And how do you see that? How do you see his influence in the country affecting fatherhood going forward and the issues surrounding it, you know, family and stuff like that? Well, it's interesting. I grew up with a great father. You know, he was there, but he was a strict father. And I resented like him. a good father. Yeah, right. Well, growing up in, you know, the secularized liberal America as it was becoming, you know, in the 80s through the 60s and, you know, into the 80s. And I grew up in the 80s and 90s. Uh, the children are now still, you know, I struggle with my children, encouraged to resist, hmm. you know, the... Uh, strict parents or boundaries in general, particularly from the home, yeah. you know, so I received a lot of my instruction from media and school, you know, which, you know, is very feminized. He yeah. doesn't want the father to be strong. My dad grew up in the jungle. He grew up in Belize and yeah. he, his, his, he's just based on instinct. I don't think my dad learned how to be an alpha. Hmm. He just had no choice because he was from the jungle. Yeah. So I resisted him. He was really tough. I'm grateful now as an adult. I started to recognize his value as a strict conservative father when, you know, when I became maybe around 27, okay. 27, 28, when I started reaching my 30s. And then I started counting. Is there a reason for that or it just kind of happened that way? Well, by then I had three daughters and, uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, so my life was well underway. So I got to understand why he was that way. Got it. With that, I began to count the ways that his is being conservative and being strict were valuable. And when I see Donald Trump behaving the way he is, saying the things he is, he says, doing the things he does, I'm like, that's my dad. And those are all the, those are all the <laughs> great things that I hated about my dad, but it took a certain amount of maturity for me to accept. Hmm. So, uh, you know, now that I see everybody resisting Donald, the yeah. Donald. Hashtag resist. Yeah. <laughs> right. They just resist him. They hate him. They fight him. I realize how much our culture has turned into whiny teenage brats yeah. instead of grown, conservative, strong men. And so it's interesting for me to watch, you know, particularly men. Like, you know, I, a lot of my followers are, are strong men, you know, like they lift for, for a living. Like that's what they do. Mm. But to see them be whiny liberal brats in the face of a <laughs> in the face yeah, of a yeah. strong man yeah uh is, is a little daunting yeah it's interesting too i did uh there's there's a lot of ways you can analyze politics in this country the past couple of years and right now and trump but i think emotional maturity and people responding to it negatively because they're lacking that maturity that's that's pretty interesting mm -hmm. and that's something you see talked about much people just want to blame you know orange man bad and you know hashtag mm -hmm. resist because whatever fucking reason Mm -hmm. See, I think that's a good way to put it. And I see, I do see the parallels you're saying. Yeah. Right. Your father, yeah. They're very emotional about it too. Yeah. And I remember that, you know, when I, being a kid, like it was an emotional uh, anger towards, like towards lashing my dad. out. Right. They're yeah. not logical about it, which, all, yeah. which is a, a red flag that yeah. there's something wrong. They, they just, they, they call names, they judge. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking now what's popping in my head is uh, on the inauguration day, that yellow vest. I think it was a girl. I don't actually know. It was a girl or a guy. She was like screaming. She was like, oh. no. Nah! Right. And like it, it's recorded in history now. Like that yeah. was, that was, <laughs> that like made the day. But it's, yeah. I think it, that's just a, sm a small expression of what you're saying or right. what you're focused on, which is a lot of people are doing that. Men and women both too. Or yeah. male, we'll call them males, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't right, you gotta be them, careful. Yeah, you gotta be careful. Yeah, I don't call them men. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, let's bump off a little about uh, that a little bit. How has your philosophy changed in the past, say, year, year and a half since you found, you got a little bit more interested in MGTOW stuff, the red pill, the manosphere? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not involved in MGTOW much myself or anything, but obviously it's part of the manosphere. Mm -hmm. So since finding Rolo's work, since finding 21 conventions, since finding the Red Man Group, how's that influenced you? Uh, positively, negatively, you know, new ideas? In a myriad of different ways. First of all, uh... Big shout out to Rolo. Like yeah. I, I had, I was reflecting on his books and their impact hmm. on my, you know, the, my new, new ways of thinking. You would say since last April or May, and you know, although my life is great, my life is amazing. I wouldn't change a single thing about it. Hmm. Uh, I w I made a lot of the decisions that I made to get to where I am in a very unconscious way. I didn't know what I was doing. 
I was just following my instinct, following my gut, following the pattern. You know, if I look at my life and I look at my father's life, that's you know part of the reason why it's good to have a strong father as a yeah. as a pattern. I didn't have to make too many decisions. I was being what my father was. Set an know? example was. Set an example was. So my life turned out well, uh, you know, just like his. But being able to look back uh, with red pill lens mm. lenses, uh, particularly as it related to uh, the way I thought of and dealt with women, and the way I thought of and dealt with my wife, and how we ended up uh, being together since we were fourteen years old and marrying her. If, mm. I, if, if I read Rollo's book when I was. 17, I probably wouldn't still be with my wife. <laughs> Holy shit. And that doesn't mean that, you know, like I said, I love her. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. One of the things that it, you know, really s- struck me this year was my ability to look at my life objectively and see how sex at a young age uh, put me on this path. Not to say that it's a, it's a wrong path, but I could see how it could lead so many young men yeah. t- on the wrong path, you know. It's a uh, powerful motivator. Right. I was blinded because I was having sex. That's, I think that's one of the biggest paradigm shifts for me and opinion changes that a lot of people are confused about. Where I say, you know, I tell my children having sex before marriage is not a great idea. Even though Rolo talks about, you know, splate plate spinning and stuff and i'm like i'm okay i'm cool with that i understand it but just from my experience and my wisdom and what i can see Mm -hmm. i have to assert that promiscuity is not a good idea Mm -hmm. particularly if you're unaware of the uh the the nature of this intersexual dynamics between men and women Mm -hmm. we think we're in set when in love a lot of times and i see these guys you know head over heels they're bawling they're tore up and because it's emotional tells me right away like if you're if you're attached to a woman emotionally you don't really love her you're attached to her sex hmm. sex is physical emotion is physical to really love a woman is logical i've learned that i love my wife more now because i've been able to separate sex slash emotion from the relationship and all the chemical responses you're getting from right. that. Right. And the okay. jealousy and the, the anger. I remember being like jealous and angry. It was very emotional, you know, yeah. when I was a teenager with her. Yeah. And throughout. And I carried that into adulthood, but in a, in a suppressed and unconscious way, I didn't know. Okay. And it wasn't until I separated sex and emotion, which is all very physical, they're together, mm. uh, from consciously loving my wife. I think for a man to... To love a woman, he has to know that he doesn't need her sex. Mm. Otherwise, it's an addiction. Yeah. It's an emotional, physical addiction. So that has been wonderful. That has, it's been great to be able to separate those two and to know mm. that I love my wife uh, logically. Beyond, beyond just the feeling. Beyond needing her for the sex. Because mm. if that's the case, uh, they'll always have you by the balls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and breathe from your balls. Oh yeah, breathe down into them and grab them, baby. You gotta own them. Yep. So let's shift gears again here a little bit. If uh, in your so let's it's be kind of a Yo Elliot kind of question. If a father of a family is in trouble, who should he turn to? The father. You mean like God? Yep. Okay. So our ancestors understood that men always needed a pattern. Men are like a clean slate. Hmm. And if we're not given a path or given a pattern, which is where the word paternity comes from and patriarch, uh, then we can be easily inscripted upon. And so it's either going to be we take on the nature of our mother or we take on the nature of uh, the, the popular culture at large, both of which would either be uh, emotional or, or the popular culture leads you astray. Yeah. And so a father is, for, for someone with a good father, which is my prayer and hope for every young man moving forward in this new patriarchy. Yeah. Uh, you, you turn to your father. What would, what would my father do? 
But our fathers, even if they were there, are flawed. As, as much as I'm, you know, I love my dad and my dad did a great job and I'm, yeah. I wouldn't trade him for the world. He's kind of, he's, he's messed up in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. But he has no choice. He's in a fallen state. We're physical. It is through the example of the father. My father looks to the father. My father makes no plans. My father is, and my father's faith is not a religious faith. My father's faith is a, is a very primal faith. Like I say, he grew up in the jungle. Mm. So he doesn't philosophize about God. He trusted God. That's how he like, he laughs sometimes like, I don't know how the hell I got here. Yeah. I don't know what I did. But the, and he calls him the almighty. He said, the almighty just f- carried my steps. He was just a light onto my feet. Well, you know what comes to mind too when you say that is that you know, even if you had a great father, first of all, if you had a father, you know, not everyone does, but then even if you have a father and he was a great father, literally nobody's father is perfect. Everybody's father's made mistakes. Mm-hmm. I've never met a human being in my life that hasn't made a mistake. Right. So the example will never be perfect for anybody. Right. Uh, and a lot of men have bad examples, but some have, you know, decent ones or good mm-hmm. ones or great ones. So it's going to come to mind that no matter what example you got, it's going to be flawed. I it's work like, with a lot of young men that have awesome fathers, mm-hmm. like in every single way. And they still resent their dads. And it's it's very unconscious. And, you know, there are many different reasons why that may be the case. Mm. But I think that's okay Mm. because he's going to die. He's 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 human, like you said. So when I answered you, the father, it is literally the God, the eternal pattern, the father that is flawless. And so we can turn our face and turn our hearts to that which we know is always loving us, always guiding our steps, always forever forgiving, and always, if we can empty ourselves of our ego, which a lot of our, you know, too much thinking or philosophizing or resisting uh, is pure ego, if we can empty ourselves of that, of that, and I, you know, we spoke earlier about the body being the mind. Yeah. I also say too, if you are struggling, like you, your question asked, mm. you got to fast. You got to get. You can't come to God with a full belly. This is one of the East yeah. Christian Orthodox things. You got to empty your belly. You got to empty your soul. You got to purge yourself, and you got to open yourself humbly to be led by the Father, and you will be guided. We're not alone. So mm. if you are struggling right now, it's only because you're. You're not turning to the Father. You're all clogged up and you're trying to do it on your own with your ego. Mm. You've got to purge all that and then just turn to like what my father says, the Almighty, and let him guide you. Would you say too that you have to get, one of our old speakers used to say, you need to get out of your head and into your body. Is that uh, similar to what you're saying? Yes, but, and I've, I've spoken about that a lot and okay. I've, I've said a lot of wrong things. I've changed my mind on a lot of things. Same. Getting into the body can also be uh, very emotional mm. and we can confuse the sensation of emotion with actually being led. When, when we're being led, it should feel relaxed. Mm. If we're too excited about something oh this is it this is it this is it that kind of yeah. feeling it's too emotional you got to calm down you got to stop or if it's anger whatever it is if it's colored by an emotion you're in your body but you're in the in the the dark part of the body mm. when your body is relaxed it's it's logical but you feel you feel a buzzing, you know, because there's also, you, there's a spectrum too. Mm. You can be overly emotional or you can be schizoid. You can be completely detached. So are these men and a lot of people, this is where they, they struggle. They're either, the over feminization of masculinity or men ends up looking like femi- emotionality. Okay. They're like oceans. <laughs> and... Uh, the over masculinization, the other end of the spectrum that's way too far also too, is complete dissociation. I don't feel my body. I haven't felt my body in a long time. I don't know what it's like to cry. I don't know what it's like to laugh. I don't know what it's like to have any emotions at all. It's like robotic. Right, robotic. Yeah. And that's a scary place too because, yeah. you know, I said that men are a clean slate. Well, you don't want to be so clean that you're only being led by your head. Because, because then you, you're filled up with facts. And these are guys that live in their head. Yeah. They have no intuition whatsoever. So it's sort of an, an in-between place. Yeah, you have a lot of interesting ideas. It's, uh, 
it's fun to see, you know, we're t- talk, trying to talk, we're talking about fatherhood and then like all these other tangential uh, topics get introduced to it. Yeah. It's, um, it reminds me of how diverse your background is. Like people see you just a strong man, like strength camp, but there's mm-hmm. like a whole branch of other mm-hmm. things going on here. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's good. I'm it's interested good. In, in how this whole thing works, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm interested in myself. Yeah. And in exploring myself, it's just led me down all these different roads. Yeah. That's been the story of the convention too over the years and my own history too is like going through all these speakers, all these topics, all these authors. It's like one thing branches off the next. And to me, it's a good sign of an active mind. Right. Like people say, you know, you need to be uh, open-minded, not Mm closed-minded. I disagree. I think you need to be active-minded in search of the truth, in search of knowledge. And typically that leads people down, like you've gone, I think, comprehensive and diverse paths. So it's really, it's really it's fascinating seeing it. It's like you're going from Jesus to Eastern Orthodoxy to fatherhood, to patriarchy, to the jungle, to like, yeah. to, you know, to being in your body and yeah. spirituality. It's, it's yeah. awesome shit, man. Yeah. Life is like a cornucopia, man. Yeah. yeah. They, they used to honor the Renaissance, man. Yeah. And I think a part of what's, uh, what's brought us to where we are right now in, yeah. in the patriarchy. And, you know, it's very masculine to, to break things up, chop things up. It's create boundaries and borders. Compartmentalize. Compartmentalize. We've overdone that in so many different areas, including our our self cultivation, our education. Mm. And so you've got people that are specialists, but they're so smart about one thing that they're dumb about everything else. Yeah. And you know, I used to feel bad. You know, they would say that you're a dilettante. You know, just dabbling with all. I'm not an expert in anything. Oh, quite dabbler. Frankly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm a, yep. I. I and I used to feel bad, like maybe, like what if I were to be an expert? I wish I were an expert and, and I could be known for one thing. Yeah. I realized that, well, that's not the gift. The gift is to be broad spectrum and to be able to take ideas from a myriad of different areas mm. and, and turn it into something. Integrate I, it. Because there's so much information available today, I think that the, the artist and the genius of the future is the one that can take lots of different diverging ideas and then create a brand new like take all the broad palette and create a brand new painting with it yeah hell yeah that's what i do with my convention man that's like been the whole for years people have called it like a painting that i built or like a framework and then i paint it with speakers elliot and rollo whoever yep yeah what's interesting too what you said with that to me is uh like what you're saying i see that as fundamentally different from being a dabbler which i've heard of that too over the years mm. self-improvement especially in the pickup community and the manosphere dudes they dabble with all this like different bullshit right and then they get burnt out or bored or whatever they do. Mm-hmm. But it's like diversity of interests, but with competence and seriousness and genuineness, not just like this light kind of dabbling, like, oh, I'm going to like improve my fitness like 5%, you know, mm-hmm. whatever, and all this other little bullshit. Mm-hmm. I learned how to get phone numbers from girls. So it's, I agree with what you're saying. And that's, mm-hmm. that's how it strikes me. Emerson says that uh, the gift is to create not a philosophy, but a living philosophy. Mm. So when I quote unquote dabble or I'm looking into all these things it's not because I want to fill my mind with more ideas so that I can sound cool I fill my mind with all these ideas because I see them as pieces that I can use practically in my own life to get a result that I want and as I take each piece you know sometimes I reject them but as they take take each piece (laughs) and apply them maybe for a season in my life or for a particular problem I'm having uh, or to heal something, it just goes into the tool belt as something that I can say is yes, this is good, and I can refer back to it if I'm looking to support or help someone else. Yeah, let's uh, shift gears again here a little bit. So, and then to lead us into something pretty neat for the entire title of this uh, episode. Yeah, man. How have you seen fatherhood change in your lifetime? Growing up in the '80s and '90s and the 2000s, you saw it. You saw culture changing. You saw politics changing. You saw all these different things. You saw uh, you know, life changing, mm-hmm. you know, the internet coming, you know, coming of age, cell phones, but have you seen fatherhood change during that time? You know, I gotta be completely honest when I think about fatherhood, of course I have my experience with my own father. Mm. Uh, but then all I can look to is pop culture, Got it. television and growing up in the eighties, uh, the fathers that had the, the, left the biggest imprint on my mind were uh, Al Bundy. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah Al yeah. Bundy. And, you know, uh, absorbing that, like, I thought Al Bundy was amazing. I was like, he's my hero. Because the show was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy was like, his jokes were off the hook. He was amazing. 
Um, now that I look back and see the social engineering going on, you know, how yeah. much of a, a, a fool he was and how weak he really was, mm. uh, it, 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 well, interestingly, he, he was a strong father compared to what we see now on TV. I mean, that, that's I don't know to... today's media. I've stopped you it's, know, it's that taking bad. it in. It's that bad. But I did watch. Yeah. Well, opinion. let me go back because there are a couple of movies that I saw. But there was there was Al Bundy, and you're right. You know, he was strong because he had an opinion and he spoke his opinion, and he he created yeah. the No Ma'am group. Yeah, yeah. When I told my brother because yeah, yeah. we grew up watching uh, Al Bundy, when I told him about MGTOW yeah. and and Red Pill, and that I was into yeah. this, and it was pretty cool stuff. He was like. Sounds like no ma'am yeah, yeah. <laughs> without Bundy. Yep. So yes, you're right. I, I do agree with you. Uh, but then there was Homer Simpson and Bill Cosby. Yeah. Heath, Heathcliff Huxtable. Those are the dads that I think of uh, in terms of what imprint was left on my mind hmm. uh, outside of my home. How it's changed since then, I don't know. Maybe that would maybe that's something you could tell me more about because I yeah. you know I don't watch too much media I, anymore. I try to not to watch it either, yeah. yeah. But I try to stay I try to stay in tune with like what's going on with it. Yep. And I I know for example too, I looked recently, I was looking at The Simpsons, I was reading an article about it and Fatherhood. And basically at the beginning of The Simpsons, when it first aired, I think in the late eighties or whatever mm -hmm. it was, or the nine, early nineties, uh, Homer wasn't quite the buffoon he is now. Mm -hmm. Like he was still it was still goofy and stuff, but there was actual like uh, almost like morals to the, each episode yep. or there was like Homer had a purpose for doing what he did. There was still some redeeming quality to, to not just to him as an individual or even as a man, but as a father. And that I think is what they've tracked in the episodes is that's like gone. That's been gone for years. Yeah. And it was a slow erosion over time. And the other, you know, the culture has been changing since the late eighties or whenever mm -hmm. it started. So it, that's probably just tracking with the rest of the culture and they're responding to it. But it's interesting to see it then expressed like that or, or being played out as propaganda even in a mm -hmm. like kind of light propaganda. Um, then you also saw other, you know, uh, TV shows spring up. I think Modern Modern Family is a good example. I've seen like a few episodes here and there. And the fathers in these these episodes, the buffoonery is like, not even just buffoonery. It's not like they're just clowns or something all the time. It's like they're absolutely useless at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Where it was, you know, the beginning, say, with Homer Simpson, he wasn't quite that bad. There was still something he was doing to his fam for his family. Right. Going to the nuclear power plant, you know, fucking something up, but still coming home and loving his kids. Mm -hmm. So now it's just gotten, you know, Rolo talks about this a lot, that, um, you know, we saw we saw the, the concept and the hashtag of toxic masculinity just recently, a couple years ago that started. Mm -hmm. And that that's like gone now. Now it's all masculinity is toxic. Right. It's no longer even categorized. Mm -hmm. They've in a span of two years since Trump took office or whatever. It's like everything masculine is toxic. All fatherhood is toxic. I saw actor, uh, actor Terry Crews, uh, the big, the huge black guy the other day. He, um, he's usually super pro feminist, like all this crap. Right. Yeah. But he went like on Twitter, like lightly pro fatherhood. Like, obviously it's important. You know, we know <laughs> that, but he, the fact that he even dare suggest that he got like viciously attacked he apologized for some of it, not all of it, thank God, from what I saw, but a little bit of it. And it's just amazing to see a guy who is a father, who's proud to be a father to some extent, in spite of the feminist crap. And then the second he steps out of line, he just gets like viciously attacked, like little like viruses attacking him. Mm -hmm. And I think that that would not have been the case in the, in the 80s or 90s, not even close. No. In the 2000s, maybe. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I grew up mostly in the 90s. I was born late 80s. Mm -hmm. But I'm just old enough to know like the Al Bundy, like uh, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you watch Family Matters too. Uh, oh, uh, it was another black family show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. The guy was a cop. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That one strikes me too. Is like you wouldn't see that today. No, I don't. I didn't watch a lot of the show, mm -hmm. but I watched enough of it to where it was like it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't like the absolute buffoonery and debasement of fatherhood we see today. Right, which is just rampant. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think these are topics too. We'll see other speakers speak about at the convention coming up. The Patriarch Edition of Twenty One mm -hmm. Con. Let's actually focus on that a little bit. Sure. Uh, what speakers, other speakers at the conference, are you excited to uh, to meet or to see speak? Uh, you've, so, you've so far met Socrates, Hunter Drew, and Rolo Tomasi. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, you know, there's more. Yeah, more. of course, all three of them, especially knowing them personally, and I think they're great yeah. guys. So can't wait. Um, I don't know if he, is uh, Dr. Sean T. Smith yeah. going to be there? I, I just talked to him, yeah. Really love a lot of his videos uh yep. i've been meaning to get the tactical guide to women yeah which uh i i imagine just by watching his videos is an amazing book i have yet to get it 
but uh, being one of those books that every young man just needs to put on his shelf. Yeah. So uh, yeah, those are those are the guys that I'm oh, familiar yeah. with and really looking forward to to hearing speak. I didn't realize. <laughs> how much of a wealth of information and an experience Socrates was yeah. until I got to sit in, <laughs> <laughs> sit in the car with him on our ride to... Yeah. to uh, he was one of my favorites. Shooting. Sure. Man, he is awesome. So I can't wait to see what he lays down there. Yeah. He was actually... Um, I would say he was kind of a... I don't know if innovator is the word I'm looking for. He was like a precursor to what we're seeing now with the convention. Yep. So when he spoke at the convention back in the day, he started speaking in 2011, and he spoke in 2012 and 2014 and all that. Mm -hmm. And that was before we got involved with the Red Pill and Rolo and Hunter and all these guys. But he was the only guy back then when we had a bunch of dating coaches speaking and fitness coaches and stuff like that, Mark Sisson. He would be the one guy who would talk about relationships in depth and not just like a light brush. Like his whole talk would be about like, his first one was called, uh, what was it? Uh, a... a I can't remember the damn title, but it's like a relationship guide, a contrarian, a contrarian guide to relationships. Mm -hmm. But you know, the contrarian part aside, it was, it was an excellent talk. Um, he just focused on relationships tightly. Yeah. And this was like really unusual back then. Like the fact that you do this at like what was known, you know, halfway, at least at that point as a pickup conference was like super right. out there. Yeah. So he, he's fat. He's fit in perfectly to the new, mm -hmm. the new speaking lineup we have going on now. Yeah. Like an elder. An elder, yeah, you know, exactly. It's great for the young men. You know, I, I spoke recently about you know being in the red stage, the hot stage when testosterone yeah. comes up, and yeah. all you want to do is fight and fuck. That's great, and you need support for that. Yeah. But not given direction as well as a purpose and a yeah. vision for what's possible, and you know, ultimately that fire cools off. It will. It must cool off. Yeah. Uh, you're going to be. Well, you're going to be left with what? Yeah. And so when you have guys like Socrates talking about, okay, now that you did all the fighting and fucking, yep. you might want to know how to have a relationship. <laughs> You've definitely sat down in the car with Socrates. Yeah, right. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Elder is a really good way to put it. That's exactly what he was. Because mm -hmm. these guys were a lot younger than him. He was um, maybe 45 back then, 44, stuff like, like mid-40s. Yeah. Most of the speakers back then, some were older, like Mark Sisson, the fitness guys. But most of the, the relationship or the... The dating guys and anybody to do with like the pickup community was like late 20s, uh, early 30s, mid 30s, maybe late 30s. So he was the elder and they looked up to him. And even to this day, he's still leader at the conference. Yep. He's one of our ambassador speakers. It's like another status level for the speakers we have. The three include uh, Socrates, Rolo, and then George Bruno. Who you're going to love a lot. George Bruno is yeah. someone you got to meet. Yeah. I think we talked to you about him a little bit. I watched a couple of his videos. Yeah. Super, super uh, fun to watch do yeah. his thing on, <laughs> yeah. on yeah. YouTube with his coffee and the stirring yeah. thing. Yep. Yeah. I can't wait to meet him. Yeah. He'll interview you at the conference. He's, our, um, he's cur the current host of the 21 Report, the interview series we have, and he's killed it. Yeah, uh, he was at, he's a speaker as well, but then yeah. he does the interviews, so you'll meet him that way. Yeah, it's so cool to be opened up to this whole new world of yeah. you know, minds and men. So yep. thank you. I find the best ones I can, man. Yep, so. you're doing a great job. Fuck yeah, you're part of it, man. Fuck yeah. So this episode is titled "A New Patriarchy." We're talking about like a title before the show, a couple of different options mm -hmm. we had, but mm -hmm. a new patriarchy. We just and I like that too for the same reasons. Oh yeah. So when I, when I see my work with the 21 Convention, 21 Studios, as well as the Red Pill and the Manosphere, independent of what I do, I see us as building something new. Yeah. Like looking to the past for answers too. I think that's really important. Oh, yeah. But also like we can't, like we talked about it explicitly before the show started, you can't just wind the clock back. And even if you did, what would, what would that accomplish? You'd right. end up right where, the, where we're at now. Right. So talk to me a little bit about where you see or where you want the country to go not even the country necessarily, because it's it's all Western nations really that are under this like fatherhood and masculinity attack. Mm -hmm. But where do you want to see the culture go uh, and social socially go in relation to fatherhood? Like where does that need to go? Like a new patriarchy. Like what does that mean to you? Well, you're right. Turning back the clock and having the old content associated with masculinity and femininity and and patriarchy is no longer going to serve us. Yeah. Uh, G one of the things Jesus says is you can't put uh, new new wine in an old wine skin. So that's about content and context. Okay. So we need a new uh, we, we need new wine, but we uh, we can use the old wine skin. Let me put it that way. So I screwed that one up. Okay. I'm trying to use an analogy, but 
long story short, what I'm trying to say in a cool way is that a lot of the boundaries that have been dissolved over the past 100 to you know, 50 to 100 years uh, that are really our most important boundaries for existence collectively on this planet, that they're the last ones to have gone away and they're the first ones that are going to need to come back. It's almost like we're going to reverse order. So a lot of the... the, the ba- a lot of the boundaries that no longer uh, are necessary may or may not come back. Well, let me put it this way. I, I, heard, I heard it put really well, put really well in this old Chinese book I was reading, that if you want, to, if you want a, a, a strong, healthy, powerful world, you work within personal va- boundaries of the individual. We, we need to know our limits. We need to know our limitations. We need to know what we stand for, what we don't stand for. We have to have personal rules mm. and, and discipline. All very masculine. These are all very masculine traits. I said before that masculinity is a lot you know, about creating boundaries. Yeah. Self-boundaries. So the, the emphasis needs to be on the self and discipline okay. for the individual. Moving outward then becomes discipline between man and community and, or, or one another. And so the other, if there's one, the other would be our counterpart, counterpart our woman. Hmm. So the boundary of man and woman has to come back. It's one of the last ones to go because it's ridiculous. I was just going to say that the, the, boundary thing, the boundary thing is really interesting because the, the very boundary around biological sex, they're trying to erase that now. Right. Which is just the most basic one and it's just mm. fucking crazy. It's a clear indication that we're at end times. Yeah. Like this is as far as it could possibly go in the most ridiculous and evil way possible. Yep. To degrade the most fundamental boundaries of what makes us human beings is what I'm talking about. Yep. And to say that there's no difference between men and women it's almost comical in children too not even just adults but in children we see that now i saw recently there was like a 11 year old uh, transgender kid or some shit in new york in like a strip club or something yeah. doing some sort of you know some sort of cross-dressing show right. or something and they're glorifying it they emotionalize yeah. it and they make it so that if you're if you're against that you're some sort of a you know you're an evil person evil racist nazi but that's like, the most evil thing yeah. i define evil as as going against nature, the yeah. further you go away from nature, the further your walk from your your walk from God. You know, walking the Tao or being in uh, step with God is being in step with nature. When you say nature, do you mean like uh, trees and like the water? Or you mean like all of reality? When you say that, all of physical reality. Okay. Nature is a mirror reflection of the spiritual reality. We can't see with our natural eyes the spiritual reality, okay. but, we, but we know of its existence because of the physical mirror that we live in. And so nature, when we are honoring it and we're walking in step with it and we're letting it be our guidepost, meaning look to nature for the answers. Yep. You know, that's another way that we a lot of our answers questions could be answered you know like what should i do well what would nature do you know when you say what would god do that's really tough a lot of times because it's like god is too existential it's a supernatural consciousness right supernatural i love that natural when i say nature there's a natural world and then there's a supernatural world Mm. so if you want to know a lot more about the supernatural world look to nature yeah and in nature Everywhere across the board, there is Adam and Eve. There's male and female. Yep. I mean, I can go on too many different tangents, but to come back to your question, personal boundaries, personal discipline, morals, ethics, these are things that, that can be taught, need to be taught, hmm. but at the same time are the core. It's, it's really about the individual. Hmm. But then the other, and the counterpart of the man is the woman. And so the boundaries that are associated with honoring what it is to be a man, the nature of masculinity, and to honor what it is to be a woman and the nature of of femininity. You know, before you ask me about, you know, what's uh, destroyed the family and the father and, you know, what has put men in this weird bind is that women aren't fulfilling their natural role anymore. Birth control pills and easy abortion and women in the birth in the marketplace. No fault divorce, all that stuff. Don't liberate women. Hmm. It perverts them yeah. from the the amazing gift 
of being a womb man. That's where the one woman comes from, womb man. The man that can hold a womb. She not to say she's a man, but the but the womb that she can create so that another man or woman can come into the world yeah. is the most magnificent human gift in nature. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. And it has not only been lost, but it's looked down upon. Yep. Women keep pushing it because of the birth control pill, the easy divorce and abortion, keep pushing it later and later into the into uh, life. Which and has so really serious risks and consequences for the kid and, yeah, and the mother, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And it, they're going against nature yep. in that. But then at the same time, they, they want to have children, so then they have to use... I like to say, or I'm going to say this now, that a lot of our current nature, our current science, is antithesis to nature, meaning that it perverts nature. Hmm. It's almost like dark science. They're creating babies in petri dishes and shit, which is dark science. <laughs> right? Even you know even that. psychology, though, even like the APA ruled the American Psychological Association, they ruled that like traditional masculinity is basically toxic. Right. Sean Smith's been like railing, you know, railing against that, of course. But that's considered like legit science today, and that's just fucking crazy. Yeah, evil yeah. science. Yeah, it's dark science. You know, yeah. so it might be science. Yeah, they're doing it to manipulate nature. Yeah, but it doesn't. It doesn't bring us closer to God. Science should bring us closer to God. I truly believe that. I don't think there's a division between science and religion. Hmm. Science is the study of the natural world. It should be a search for the truth, and I think that's where scientists today and anything related to that has gone way off the rails in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. They're not searching for the truth. They're not searching for reality. They're talking about erasing genders and how that's all. They're trying to legitimize all that crap into like. I think that's I, they consider themselves scientists and like truth seekers, but they're not. Like these yeah. people with PhDs in gender studies or whatever the fuck they have, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they have their. They're they're getting their strings pulled also too by those yeah. with the agenda. So I've there's a lot of, of fake I've, science. I've heard it put too that uh, a lot of modern science is like, I forget what they called it, but it's tantamount to what you saw like in the dark ages. Yeah. Like people just preaching like all this random shit and like, oh, this is totally legit. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, actually like there's two sexes and that's like very, you know, common sense. Like yeah. every day, it should be like a common sense fact. It was when we were growing up. Right. You know, in the nineties, you know, having to call somebody, somebody asking to call them Zer or some other random, right. you know, 67 genders would have been like the most nonsensical crap. Right. It's like, what's it's happened silly. in just a couple of years, you know? That's why it'll be the easiest one to put back together. That's why yeah. I'm so staunch on this right now, because I'm like, yeah. all right, we've got as ridiculous as we can. Yeah. And if we want to start putting it back together again, yeah. we, we don't have to go too far, like into the past, like you were saying. We don't, we don't need to create the old uh, uh, rules and, and, and mental boundaries. The most physical boundaries are the easiest ones to put back together again. And yeah. that's why it's like, this is a no-brainer. Yeah. yeah, there's man there's man and female. There's male yeah. and masculine and feminine. So that one as uh, we've we've pushed it to the limit. I don't I don't think the the deep dark state can push it any further through their media and propaganda machines. Yeah. Uh you know, calling this the new patriarchy and seeing Donald Trump yeah. as an I really do believe that he's a torchbearer for that. Oh yeah. He's a he's a leader in that. Not him per se but the fact that the American people gave him their thumbs up and will continue to. We'll put, we'll put. Is, is saying that our souls are thirsty for a strong masculine patriarch. And boundaries that come with it, like the wall and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fact that he wants to build a yeah. wall. A giant boundary. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's the, you know I said that it's, it, the physical world is an expression of God. Yeah. It's almost like God saying, you need some boundaries here. You guys are getting crazy. Put up a wall. And it's yeah. funny throughout the Bible, there there were uh, there's so many stories about the wall walls in the Bible. You oh, know, uh, I, I think is one of the guys, Jer Jeremiah or you know, some weird Old Testament name. Mm. He was called to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall, and mm. it was like his whole. He was called by God, and it was whole, his whole mission was we got to build this wall. I thought it was so yeah. like almost like history doing this again. History repeats itself. History is a cycle, yeah. but I like to think of it as an ascending spiral. Same. We're we're moving up in our consciousness. It needs to too. We're getting lighter, but it's yeah. repeating itself. Yeah. So Donald Trump, you know, there's this picture of him in 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 uh, Israel, I think somewhere. Touching the with wall. With his hand yeah, on the wall. Yeah, I'm yeah. like that is so poetic in so many different ways with his hand on that wall. 
yeah. and what he represents and what that wall represents. You know, taking a step back, I really like what you said about uh, embracing, I, I interpreted it as embracing your nature as a man or a woman. And I think I completely agree that, you know, both men and women today have completely abandoned that. Yeah. I think women a little bit harder, but it, it's really like a minor difference. Like both are completely off the rails right yeah. now. And it, for the most part, and I do see, for example, the manosphere and particularly the red pill community and even other elements of it, like the pickup artist community and stuff, teaching men how to be successful with women or at least succeed with the opposite sex, regardless of the specific goals of it. I see the manosphere overall as teaching men how to embrace their nature, how to be more masculine, yep. genuinely, not this like fake, uh, you know, like apologetic masculinity, like, oh, I'm a man until you make me apologize on Twitter. Like, no, masculine, I'm going to lead my family. That's why I actually called this event the Patriarch Edition rather than the Fatherhood Edition. I almost called it the Fatherhood Edition, and that was the original title before we launched it. Mm -hmm. And like a few weeks beforehand, I'm like, wait a second, wait a second. You know, fatherhood feels a little bit too specific. Yeah. That isn't necessarily, uh, you know, that doesn't cover everything. Fatherhood is fatherhood, but it's not like leadership, for example. It's not maybe navigating a divorce for your child, you know, mm -hmm. God forbid. So yet I came across the term, of course, patriarch, and I was like, this is fantastic for like 10 different reasons. Mm -hmm. It's the ultimate hate hated word by feminists, mm -hmm. but also signifies leadership, you know, mm -hmm. more than fatherhood, like we talked about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Anybody can go knock a chick up, but to be a, a strong leader and a father, to embrace your nature mm -hmm. as a man, yeah, it's powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, it's it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a father, but it I think the word patriarch, especially coming, I love the word roots and, you know, pattern. Mm. So there's so much confusion now about so many different things, but about fatherhood, what it is to be a father. Why would you want to be a father? A lot of people don't want to be fathers and I don't blame them. I understand. Mm. But the word patriarchy is so overarching that you can take on the, and this is amazing. You could take on the characteristics and the values of a father and be a father figure in the world, yeah. a truly a father figure without having offspring yep. through this idea of patriarchy rather than fatherhood. So that just came to my mind and I like the way that you said that. It's, it's broad reaching and that every man who wants to be an elder, every yeah. man who sees himself being of value past his fighting and fucking fire stage yeah. has to, would benefit himself in the world and the world by learning the ways of the patriarch yeah yeah i love the way you put that the uh, the fighting and the fire and the fucking state <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah i think that's where i've been heading uh you know for a couple of years now mm -hmm. we'll see where i end up with that but i do want to build a family someday and you know for mm -hmm. example uh i almost didn't allow anybody into this conference who wasn't already a father speaker or attendee even mm -hmm. staff i was going to make an exception but you know that brings to mind though that I, I changed that. Mm -hmm. Rollo was one of the guys who convinced me to do that, yeah. that I should let young men into the conference yeah. who are aspiring fathers like myself. I was actually asked yesterday, I went on a podcast with Rollo and a few of the other speakers, Steve the Dean Williams and Donovan Sharp. And Donovan actually, the host asked me, you know, how am I gonna build a family? It was, it was a genuine, sincere question too. Cause it's like fucking hard today. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's an understatement. It's like, cause I couldn't even give him. this. I told him, I was like, I don't really have a direct answer for you. Yeah. Cause the environment is that much of a feminist hellscape. Yeah. There's so many dangers and obstacles to doing that. I believe it's possible. Mm -hmm. Like I see, like you mentioned history being an upward positive spiral. It's repeating itself in some ways, but yeah, I'm, I'm determined to do it. And I guess my question here is, uh, do you have like some basic, maybe top two ideas for young men to want to build families? Like how to do that today? in this like very dangerous environment where you can get, uh, there's so many pitfalls you could fall into today. So. Yeah. And it, it kind of brings me back to your question uh, about, you know, where fatherhood's going and stuff like that. And one of the things that I think we've, we've got to establish uh, is to de-establish hmm. marriage from the establishment, okay. from the state. And I do believe it is it's good for us to pair bond. Yeah. I, I believe that it's good for a man to be with a woman, a single woman, and to build their lives together in that unit. Um, and, you know, we may work backwards, and there may be a time where we go back to tribal units, and maybe it's not as important. But today it is important for a man and woman to be together to raise their family. Yeah. And so... Um, what was I going to say? Well, let me kind of throw this in the fire. Mm -hmm. If you could tell your 21-year-old self, I don't know if you're married by that point, mm -hmm. maybe, 
you know, yep. one or one I or two. I got married at 23. Okay. So if you could tell your 23 year old self the day you got married, one or two things that you've learned since then, mm -hmm. like what would you add to your mind back then? What would you add to your soul back then? Not that you need to undo your past. Like I mm -hmm. fully agree with you the way you put that earlier. You are yeah. who you are. Okay. I remember where I was going to go with that, but I'll, I'll take the diversion. Okay. Um, and I basically said what I needed to say. It needs to be separate from the state and we need to go back to honoring our own relationships and maybe even bring it back to religion. Yeah. You know, but not political religion, true religion. Uh, one of the pieces of advice that I would have given myself is to have stopped having sex with my, with what was my girlfriend at the time. Mm. You know, so if I was 21... And it was a matter of, okay, now you're, you know, you're going to get married in two years. Or if that dawned upon me that maybe I want to marry this woman, mm. uh, I would have stopped living with her. And, you know, I first would have had to believe in my mind that I love her. Okay. Love can't just be, again, emotional. But I would needed to have tested it for myself. Huh. And so I think that's a part of the reason why the old school way of dating without sex was, is important. Mm. Because it's like, okay... Can you love this woman even without the sex? And I haven't had sex with many women, so I, you know, but I can only imagine that sex is sex. Um, there's been a lot of manipulation in sex that has destroyed it. Yeah. Uh, I think pornography has destroyed sex for us, for men. And I think birth control pills has destroyed sex for women. Yeah. The fact that uh, with birth control pills and um, uh, porn really reduce our, our libido, reduce our sexual power and our prowess hmm. and our sexual instinct. Women who are on birth control pills aren't, they're, they're not sexual. They're, yeah. they're more emotional. They're emotional in how they choose their partners. They're emotional in the choices they make with their partners. It changes the way they think too. Right, yeah. yeah. My wife was on uh, birth control pills growing up, uh, okay. you know, being young. And uh, it wasn't until after we started to have children because she was after birth control pills yeah. That she started becoming a rock star in bed, like sex. <laughs> sex was so much better. She does things, yeah. and I'm like, "Wow!" When you we were 16, you were just <laughs> laying there like a sack. But now, yeah. because she's not on those hormones any longer, so a lot of men who you know complain that uh, you know that my wife isn't really or my girlfriend isn't really into it. You know the way they, especially, I could talk about the way porn destroys our imagination about what sex really is. Also, mm -hmm. too, uh, no. That <laughs> part of the reason why she's probably a, a sack of potatoes in the bed is because she's on the birth control pill. So it's yeah. like you're having sex so that she doesn't get pregnant. But at the same time, your sex is going to suck because she, she didn't have it. She can't do it. She's less uh, responsive and less expressive, I think is what you're saying. Yeah. And so yeah, it perverts yeah. sex. Yeah. So I would have, if I, the first piece of advice would be no sex. There, I have so many different logical reasons why I, you know, I'm standing by that these days. Yeah. But I would say... Stop living up together. My wife and I basically started living together when we were in high school. Wow. Because uh, her parents didn't have, well, both of my parents, both her parents and my parents dissolved a lot of boundaries that, uh, that I will now uphold. And, you know, I'm grateful for the decisions they made because it brought me to the life that I am right now and I, I love my life. But, uh, her parents didn't care that she was at my house all the time. Yeah. And my parents didn't care that I was 16 years old and locked up in my bedroom with my girlfriend all the time. So yeah. we basically started living with one another. I didn't know myself as an unmarried. When I say that married, I mean we were having sex. And I say to, if you're a young man watching this right now and you're having sex with a girlfriend, I, I say you're married. You're basically married because now you've got that deep, if especially if it's you know one woman you're with yeah you're you're married so uh i would have said separation from living together hmm. if you and you could, if you're listening to this right now and you're a young man and you're thinking that you love your woman and you're thinking you want to marry her put it to the test yeah. and this is the test that i'm saying and it comes from religion which i think is great because what it's going to do is, is what i spoke about earlier is empty you it's going to empty you of neediness of emotional attachment of the pride all the bullshit clouding your judgment yeah yeah there's a lot of false pride that comes with having sex yep. as a man 
and you may or may not recognize it, but you to, to have a woman and to be having sex with a woman, there's almost a swagger that comes along with it yeah. that cloud, <laughs> clouds your judgment. You walk out of the room like it. Yeah. Yep. That clouded judgment that made me thought that I was something more than I was, all that needs to be purged, cleansed, so that you can open yourself and actually be led. And by creating that separation, those you know that time away from sex and from physical dependence in, in your constantly being with one another mm. will give you the space to say, okay, do I really love this woman? Mm. It's a scary thing too. You'll, and here's another thing that you know I discovered it's in retrospect also too, that a lot of jealousy will come up, a lot of fear. At least I know I had to purge. Your had demons to are going to come out. Huh? Your demons are going to come out. All, All kind of. If you're, if you're already attached with a woman, if you're already having sex with a woman, hmm. uh, and you do what I'm going to say to you right now, number one, you're strong. You have to be strong. And I don't mean strong. I mean strong in a very manly way, meaning I'm ready to face my demons. I'm ready to do battle with the dragons because your fears are going to come out. Oh, no. What is she going to think? Oh no! Is another man gonna uh, want to have sex with her? And she's Am I gonna, gonna lose go, her? Am I gonna lose her? Yeah. All these things, and especially if you take, if you stop having sex with her, and you for the for her good health because you love her, get her off of the hormones, get her off of the birth control pills. Mm. Wife or woman, I love you, and because I love you, or believe I love you, we're gonna create some separation. In that, I would love for you to begin cleansing your body by getting off of the hormones. Mm. She's gonna get, she's gonna be emotional. She's gonna get horny, and this so not only nice. are you testing yourself and your own resolve and your own strength, you're mm. testing her also too. Yeah. What kind of woman is this? When she's on the pill and she's attracted, they're very easy when they're on the pill when it comes to their leaning on betas. Yep. They, 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 their attraction to alphas aren't very strong you know that's why there are a lot of like social justice warrior women out there that i see commenting on my youtube videos that i'm like you just have you're so filled with excessive female hormones that you have this misplaced maternal instinct that doesn't allow you to see clearly and you're just leaning on these overly beta male ideas of what a man should be i think there's studies on this too that this is what birth control does consistently to women is it pushes them towards those nice guys mm -hmm. and the second they get off of it the behavior changes and the desires change and leads to cheating and all kinds of shit this is <laughs> and like really so if she gets off the pill and she gets horny and she cheats yeah. hey that is the greatest thing that ever happened to you yep because at least now you know yep before she gets off the pill here's what could happen she gets off the pill yep you get, she gets pregnant she doesn't go back on the pill and now she looks at you and realizes, oh, shit. Yep. No. <laughs> this, is, this is a consistent story. In the yeah. Red Pill and the Manosphere, we see guys that go through situations and experiences like that. Um, something else your, your comments here remind me about is Rolo has an idea. Um, he's put out, I think, in his first or second book. I forget where it was at exactly. But he's talked about it repeatedly. And that said, if you want to marry a chick, it's so similar to what you're saying, kind of like a test, almost like self-test. If you want to marry a chick and you're thinking about building a family with a woman, uh, you should absolutely not move in with her because of a lot of, because a lot, and Sean Smith talks about this yep. too, because of the sex and all the changes that comes with that and the, you know, the, the closeness and all that, the proximity, but you should not move in with her unless you're willing to get married like in six months flat, like, which is super fast, uh, even by today's standards, right? Yep. So it reminds me kind of what you're saying that it, you know, I see that's like a, I guess a test that Rolo has like almost for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think he's right. I think you're on to something here too. Mm -hmm. I think I'll take a lot of heat for that probably, you know, telling guys not to like bang chicks. Mm -hmm. I'm one to talk It'll take to. heat because they're emotional yeah. and they're attached yeah. and they're needy and they defend their ideas and their needs and their emotions. Well, so the, if you're listening to this and you're, and you're triggered <clears throat> yeah. and you want to judge me, try it. Just test it out. Can you do it? If you, if you can't, yeah. that means you're addicted. Don't judge me for your addiction. <laughs> What comes to mind too is uh, the level of patience and self-discipline this would require. Never mind the balls to do it. Like you know, because all kinds of potential consequences to it. Well, consequences of your fears coming out, or you know, your fears about her being expressed. She goes out and gets knocked up by some guy or fucks some other guy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's that would be the best thing that could happen to you. Yeah. But it might not feel like that, no. and you're gonna feel that temporarily. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is this is fantastic stuff, man. Fuck yeah. Yeah. And yeah, this is something. This is a message too that is not. Um, 
not often communicated or heard in the manosphere. Yep. A, a little bit from like the Tradcon stuff and the more religious guys, yep. um, which I don't have a problem with. It's patriarchy, baby. Yeah, it's patriarchy. It's the, yeah. it's the matured red pill or yeah. the matured uh, pickup. It's what's next. Yeah. You got to know these things. Yeah. You know, something I thought about too when you were talking about women earlier or anyone having sex before marriage, but I also then split it up into men and women and how they might operate differently. And it's my belief that the way women are behaving now, like 80% of them is like wrong. Like just they're getting a complete, like most women should be acting in a way very similar to what I think you're suggesting. They should be very uh, chaste. They should not be promiscuous. And doing that for women is like a very bad idea. I do think there'd always be a percentage of the population, 10, 20%, they're going to act like pretty promiscuously. Mm -hmm. They're going to be bad girls. The same way, Mm -hmm. you know, with men, you have, you know, like 80% betas and like 20% alphas. But I think we've lost that. Like 80% of women now in America, in my experience, are like pretty loose and pretty promiscuous. And that's pretty recent, I think. We um, had a place for women like that. And that's when brothels were a thing. That's yeah. where, that's where th- this may be a crazy idea, but by yeah. legalizing promiscuity, you allow that aspect of the collective shadow to be expressed in its maturity and in its fullness. So to have women that are, look, let them be the tattooed brothel women. Yeah. And pay them well, tax them, pay them well, and like any other profession, let it go to the free market. Yeah. But by the but you know we we end up now where they're all sluts. They're yeah. all you know I don't want to say all, but you said eighty percent. They're yeah. all behaving like prostitutes. They've got tattoos all over their bodies. By the time they're thirty, they've I don't know how many what the average amount of sex a woman has had with a man, but I can't think of a man. Women will always yeah, go for it. Let's do be liberated and have as much sex with as many men yeah. as you want. I don't know how many men want a woman that has had that much sex. Yeah. I don't know what man is going to rally for that, no matter how feminist you are no. and how much. Just think about it, you know. There were 57 nuts busted inside your girlfriend or yeah. your or your or this woman that you want to make your uh, make your make your wife and the woman of your child the the wife of your, mother of your children. Yeah. Being that the physical world is a manifestation of the of the or the natural world is a manifestation of the the, the supernatural. Mm. It's not that they were just physical nuts busted in her. She's taken in the nature of every single one of those men and i don't believe that your children are not affected by that there's actually science uh, like legit science that supports or suggests what you're talking about i saw it a red roller posted or somebody in the red pill about a year ago it was a study about flies and how when the when the female ones i guess get inseminated even if they don't get pregnant uh, that ends up influencing the dna of their future children like whatever little flies in it so It was posted in the red pill because everyone immediately is like, holy shit, these girls that are banging, you know, they'll fuck uh, 75 dudes or 80 dudes by the time they're 30. (laughs) You know, assuming most of that or all that was raw, birth control or whatever, like, what does that mean for your kids? Are they going to have DNA? Even if it ends up being your kid, which it might not be, it might have it might have some DNA from other men because of her behaviors. And I I agree with what you're saying that uh, the physical world, you know, her actions are a manifestation of who she is and who she's choosing to be over time. And on, in itself, I don't have a problem with that, except that has consequences. Yeah. And those consequences, like you're saying, are not something I probably want to be involved with if I want to have a mother for my children and build a family because it's right. dangerous. The woman will then flip that around mm-hmm. and say, well, that's how men act. It's like, well, you're not a man. Right. And I'm not a woman. Like, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't expect you to act like me. And you shouldn't expect me to act like you, which mm-hmm. is, of course, lost now. Mm-hmm. Everyone's this homogenous uh, NPC at this point, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like yeah. the word that you use, uh, chaste and chastity, yeah. which is a virtue. Oh, yeah. There's a reason why it was a virtue. Well, because- it's hard. Like, it takes effort. It takes discipline. Exactly like you're saying with men to make these different choices, to, to not, not just with uh, sex and women, but also with strength, masculinity, facing your demons. That requires strength. That require, That's fucking hard for men to do, and that's why we become more masculine when we do it. Yeah. For women, I think they become more feminine the more they preserve their femininity, yes. they preserve their chastity. Uh, it's, you know, our grandfathers, uh, one of the, in the red pill, they say that our grandfathers, you know, they were used to women who had zero prior partners or like one or two or something. Yeah. Now you'd be lucky. It's like buying a used car for a new car price. Yeah. A girl, girls now have <laughs> dozens and dozens of partners really fast. Yeah. 
And they'll blame guys like me that do it, but the reality is women are choosing to act like this uh, and they will continue to act like this on their own. Like, I don't cause that behavior. The guys in the red pill don't cause that behavior. These women are, are going to act like that, or they're choosing to act like that in, in spite of all criticism and consequences at this point. Mm -hmm. A lot of the consequences have been erased, of course, too. Mm -hmm. They don't feel those anymore, the slut shaming and stuff like that. I think this tendency towards promiscuity for men hmm. is as feminizing as uh, the promiscuity turns women into men. You know, women are going out there having lots of sex, and it's again, you would think of that as a masculine thing, mm. but the but the easy sex for men as a result of the birth control pill and yeah. birth control also too makes us more feminine in that we are very attached to the sensual experience of sex rather than putting it in its right, right place. So it's all about tasting the broad palate of all the different wines I could have. I the like pleasure. this kind of woman, that yeah. kind of woman. So you're really attached to that, to the physical. To, you know, I spoke yeah. about the word pattern and patriarch coming from you know, you know, and, and paternity. But being attached to the material world is very much being a mama's boy. Mm -hmm. And all physical experience, when taken to the degree that you need it or you're very addicted to it is a very feminine way to be that's why the the religions of old always had ascetics and ascetic mm. practices mm. you don't go out there and have sex with lots of women because that's not very pattern like father like god like mm. it's very feminine dark and that's always been, for men in particular been associated with evil mm. not to say that women are evil mm but the tendency towards the darkness of earthiness and emotion and sensuality can lead you down a very chaotic road. Yeah. Lots of sex with lots of women is chaos. As opposed to order. Right. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, we call it in the red pill, they call it, I think, the pleasure palace or the pleasure prison or some shit like that. <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it's, it's loosely similar to what you're talking about, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, this is this would be a good debate to have at the uh, the event. We don't really do debates, but I'm sure these would be hallway conversations guys have because mm -hmm. these are questions a lot of men have, and they're they're not just questions. They're uh, they're challenges in life you have to face, especially right now with things changing so rapidly, with technology and feminism and society and culture and politics. Oh yeah, yeah, things are changing yeah. super rapidly, and the, a lot of them are questions that nobody posed any before. It was almost he couldn't ask these questions for the past. Oh yeah, a few decades. You know, a lot of people are upset with. Yep. They're. I mean, they're calling me out about uh, my my uh, interview with Brian Rose on London Real, mm -hmm. where I didn't even make an assertion as to whether or not women should vote or not. I didn't say yes or no. I saw people the question. are attacking me. I just said I don't know. Yeah. And just by doing that, yep. I left the question mark there, and that alone was taboo. That is opposed to how the can the I ministry. not ask a question? That's yeah. when you really know that we're being censured, censored, and dumbed down. Yeah. When a question causes that much yep. pain. Well, they're trying to dictate to you how to think, and you're like, "No, I'm just going to ask a question and just leave it at that." Yeah. Which I totally support too. And I don't know the answer either to that question: women voting or not. And it's a it's a consistent you know issue or debate we have with the Red Man Group and at the convention a little bit. Uh, my current opinion is that you know. Choices have consequences. Women voting has consequences. Right. Men and women have different biologies and different psychologies. And I think we're seeing that play out with the rise of like socialism in America and things like that over in the deep state over the past like 80, 100 years. All that, you know, the debt. I don't know if you know this, but I think uh, I saw Stefan Molyneux once did like a whole presentation on it. The national debt in America has skyrocketed specifically since uh, women got the vote which makes a lot of sense with yeah. the red pill and Rolo's work and all that, women mm -hmm. wanting security and all that. And it's like, yeah, well, it's a consequence. And what are we going to do about that? That has long, eventually that's going to have a big consequence. Yep. Debt, you know, eventually has to be paid up and things like that. Mm -hmm. Trump has some good plans for it, of course. Little little borders. Yeah. Patriarchy for it. Yep. The great uh, white hope. Yeah. That's what uh, Jesse Lee Peterson calls him. Je yeah, Jesse Lee <laughs> Peterson's great. Yeah, I love yeah. that guy. <laughs> yeah, we got to get him in the convention someday. That would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, we might even do a um, a uh, black edition of the convention someday with our black speakers. Mm -hmm. And I think Jesse might come in for that or something like I that. I think that's good uh, now that I've become more red pill aware. Yeah. You know, a part of the secularization of society has been this blurring of the line and this... 
I even believe, you know, I mentioned woman suffrage in the beginning, but the, the whole called so-called civil rights movement mm. that forced integration, I don't think it's necessary. And I think these things cause more tension than is mm. is needed. I think it's okay to have boundaries. It's okay for Muslims to be Muslims and for Christians to be Christians. It's mm. okay for blacks to be blacks and for whites to be whites. It's okay for men to be men and women to be women. Yeah. And there was a time when I resisted that. And it and you know, but part of the reason why I resisted it, resisted it is cuz I'm multiracial myself. Mm. But even being of mixed race, mm. I do see the value of blacks doing black things yeah. and being okay yep. and whites doing white things and being okay not in a way that keeps us at odds with one another mm. but in a way that allows our collective strength to increase mm. so that we can do trade with one another yeah. same thing like with the countries now that you know globalism wants to destroy all the boundaries between countries yep. it's and i know a big part of the reason why is because they want it, they want everybody to be like Western capitalism, mm. and it's really it. Globalism is a is a is a capitalistic venture more than anything. It has nothing to do with human rights. It has everything to do with ursuping the minds and the hearts and the earning power of more and more people. So really, it's a greed thing. It's a power thing. It's putting everyone under the same thumb of like some sort of communist, like one world government or something like that. Yeah, that's how I see it. Yep. Uh, yeah, I agree with you though on the uh, on the culture and races having their own distinct cultures and maintaining that over time. Right. Uh, white people in particular seem to have lost their sense of identity and culture uh, mm -hmm. in America and otherwise, and that's that's unfortunate. And mm -hmm. I'm all for you. I think uh, if you're black, you should have you know your own distinct culture and you should embrace that and develop that and make it better over time. And same thing with every other, every other every other part of the culture and religion mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and Imagine like you know the gifts of the of the blacks in America. Yeah. You know, in America, you, you look at the I don't want to say the divide, but the contrast between mm -hmm. whites and you get the best of what white people can do yeah. and you get the best of what black people can do. Yeah. And just imagine if the boundaries were honored and everybody traded fairly. Mm. Imagined, imagine all, I mean, black people made music in America. Yeah. Even country music that has, is, is really white and bluegrass. I love it came from the inspiration of Afri or black people. I don't want to say African-Americans or African-Americans. A lot black of and, white. and stuff too, right? Yeah, it came from blacks. Yeah. So imagine blacks owned their, owned their own music, owned all their own music, mm. and, and, and owned all their own sports, you know? Yeah. Owned all of the things that made them gr make them great as, as artists and, and musicians, and being okay with that, not having yeah. to be more like whites, but by taking great care and honor and value in building up the gift of the black. Yeah. And then the whites doing the same thing, honoring their distinct culture, building up their values, mm. and then through honorable free trade between the two, rather than ursuping power and having a victim and uh, oppressor and apologizing for everything. And, yeah, right. White yeah. people having to apologize. It, it's yeah. all this tension. Rather than that, I think it would just it would have been amazing to honor the boundaries and play fairly. I think you had the other day, just a couple of days ago on your Instagram story, you had something, it was related to this. And I liked it a lot. I was like, it hit the nail on the head. And I forget the exact image. You, I think it was you you put up. And it was about diversity and like unity. And I think, I, I don't know if you agree with this exactly, but I believe that diversity, the way it's, you know, modernly uh, projected, it's not a strength. It's like a weakness. Yeah. But like what you're saying, though, if there's unity in like a distinct tribe or culture or group of people and they then are able to freely trade and interact with other cultures, yes. that's very positive. That's like a... Like kind of like a secondary diversity almost or something like that. Was mm -hmm. that you that posted that? I think mm -hmm. it was you. Unity in our diversity. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, there's a, another page I was following that I yeah, yeah. reposted it. Yeah. Which, yeah, I see that as, yeah. the, as the ultimate. And that's why it's good that Donald Trump is making America great again. A yeah. lot of people who are like, well, what about all the other countries? Well, what about them? Let them be great again, too. Yeah. Yeah. Let Turkey be great again. Let Mexico be great again. Yeah. Let, let every country be great again. Let us use our strengths and rise to our, our potential yep. and then 
be fair with one another. I think he even said something almost exactly like that in one of the, his his UN speeches, maybe like a year ago or something like that. Like, make your country great again. Yeah. Something similar to that, yeah. Yeah. Which I'm all about. Like, if you live in a country that you're not happy with, like, make it better. That's what we're trying to do as hard as we can. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's something I'm really, I've been really, um, I don't know if proud is the right word, but I've been impressed and uh, very happy to see it. Like, you're, you're an influencer, you're a content creator, you're an American, you're a father, you're a patriarch. And you were standing up and making a political stance uh, after you know how many years or whatever, with with your uh, with your brand and your personality and your identity and your and your ability to influence millions of people. I think it's really powerful. More men need to do that. Mm-hmm. I did that with Twenty Men Studios for my first time with Donald Trump. I endorsed him right before the election, and I lost thousands of subscribers. But I knew that I could. I think like you're doing now. I got the sense that I needed to stand up and finally make an endorsement of something that was very important to me. Whereas I never endorsed, previously I'd endorsed Ron Paul a little bit, but it was very like low key. Yeah. I didn't use the company to do it. And in this mm-hmm. case, in 2016, late 2016, I did. And I'm really happy to see you do that. And I think more, uh, whatever way they're gonna go with it, uh, they need to stand up, fathers and men, and even women need to stand up and, and speak to what they believe in and make endorsements or take action and uh, and give guidance to their fans to the extent that their fans are gonna ask them for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, some leadership like that. Like being a father, I, I actually like that a lot. You gave me the bio. Uh, to put on the website, you know, for the Patriarch edition of the 21 convention. And it said like, you know, CEO, father, strong man, all that. And then it was father figure to millions of men. Mm-hmm. And I do believe that's what you've done mm-hmm. to a generation that has grown up with uh, very emasculated fathers or no fathers. And even independent of that, you know, they're surrounded by weakness and um, anti-masculine, and anti-male messages. Mm-hmm. So you've done that successfully. And yeah. I think I think what you're doing now with uh, being a little bit more political, it's still not the primary thing that you do. Mm-hmm. It's just part of it. Mm-hmm. You're standing up for, you're, you're, it's almost like you're creating a boundary. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what has upset your fans, the ones that don't like Trump or they're just whatever, right? Mm-hmm. You, you've set up a boundary with yep. your brand, brand now. Like, yeah, I endorse Trump. Mm-hmm. You need to be okay with that or like it or you need to get the hell out of here or just right. whatever. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's, been, it's been awesome to see that and yeah, I, I hope more you. content creators do that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. One of my dad's favorite lines was, I'm the bad guy and I don't care if you hate me, but I'm going to do what's right. Yeah. And I think that's amazing also too because men are afraid to not be liked, yeah. which is very feminine. Women are, are more about being liked and being reputation. fair, reputation. Men are about doing what's right. Yep. And my father risked us not liking him to do the right thing, say the right thing, stand for the right thing, and set the right boundaries. Yeah. And knowing that I, my, it has been my path to be a father figure to millions of men means that I got to do the right thing, say the right thing, right, put up the right boundaries as a father figure, regardless of if they hate me or not. And it hasn't been until recently that I've been willing and able to, to carry that banner of yeah. being the bad guy. Yeah, yeah, the bad guy, bad guy that it holds, mm-hmm. the third Hodge twin, right? Yeah. I see they follow your stuff, I like these guys a lot. Yeah, that's right, and it's so yeah. funny, we must, be, we must be related in past lives also <laughs> too. We look a lot alike, yeah. we have a lot of the, the same fans because we're both in fitness and yeah, to yeah. have watched them. I have to say that uh, they probably, they were inspirations. And you know, if they get a chance to watch this, that'd be amazing too. Maybe I'll send it. They were inspirations for me uh, in my fitness YouTube oh, channel, cool. creating that, you know, Fuck I yeah. created my channel, but when they were like, Hey dude, if you make a lot of videos and turn on the ads, you'll make a lot of money. And yeah. I was like, all right, sounds great. It's worth it. And so I did that, and I was like, wow, thank you. And I modeled, I have to be honest, I modeled a lot of my, uh, my delivery mm. based on them. I realized that, wow, they get really close to the camera because they're good-looking guys. Yeah. And they speak directly to the camera. They're comedians too, right? Yeah. And fitness stuff too, though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they're delivering, you know, I'm, I have a different uh, character than yeah. them in a lot of ways, but my delivery is a lot like them. I look mm. a lot like them, so... I modeled that. And then mm. when I saw, you know, it took the last few years to do some soul searching, grow my family, you know, all the, I call it being in the tunnel, you know, working on myself. Uh, when I started coming back out and I saw them being vocal about their conservative stance, yeah. I was like, there go my brothers. Yeah. All right, good. They gave me a, just a little bit of courage to say, all right, fuck it. I'm just going to yeah. put out Donald Trump content. Well, I think that's what you're doing. That's, that's really what I see in what you're doing is you're encouraging other content creators who are you know, fans of yours for so many years or whatever 
uh, maybe that ends up being Ben Greenfield or other, you know, up and coming YouTubers and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like they're seeing what you're doing and they're like, all right, Elliot's got the balls to make this decision, to make this call and stand by it in the face yeah. of a lot of criticism and all kinds of people getting angry at you. Yeah. Standing up like a father would mm -hmm. as a father is in your case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Yep. So I had a question, a really specific one I wanted to ask. It's kind of personal. Um, and so we're going to shift gears here out of the, you know, political cultural landscape. Uh, how has being, how has fatherhood for you and being a father differed with your daughters versus your son, uh, in terms of like the gender difference between them? Well, what you ought to know is that I'm the oldest of mostly boys. Okay. Some old and most, mostly boy cousins growing up in a neighborhood, with a lot of boys. I was like the king of the boys. Okay. So I knew about being the oldest boy, being the leader of boys. And when I started having children, I had a daughter. Then I had another daughter and then I had a third daughter and I'm like, I don't know. And, and, and not dating a lot, you know, not knowing much yeah. about women besides my wife and my mother and my sister. Yeah. I don't know anything about women. <laughs> so I knew nothing about, and I recognized, I realized, and you know, I'm just telling my story and being personal, like you say, uh, I projected a lot of my beta characteristics upon how I was raising my daughters in the beginning. Okay. You know, putting, they would say, put the pussy on a pedestal, but, and that has to do with other women, but dads who have daughters, you know what I mean? Yeah. You put your daughter on a pedestal. Yeah, too much of the princess uh, kind of character type. Yeah, maybe or, put yeah. the princess on the pedestal. Yeah. Not wanting to hurt their feelings, not wanting to, to have them say no to them, uh, being beta, being congenial to, even my wife, she has no choice. She's a woman. She's going to lean towards a lot of lax, liberal, secular ideas and ideals. Hmm. And so having be, being overpowered in the home, if you could say, hmm. like, okay, this is what the girls want. My wife's okay with it. It's almost half a dozen of them. <laughs> <laughs> right? Much, yeah. and, I, and I yielded. Hmm. I yielded a lot. And so... Uh, and why is that dangerous or why is that bad as a father? Because it's like having two mothers. Okay. I wasn't being the boundary setter. I wasn't being a father. I was being like one of the children or like a, a lesbian in the home. Okay. You know? And so when I had my son, and I guess timing is right, I, I had to go through that experience. I truly believe in order to be of greatest value to, the, to my sons in the world, you know, to the people, the young men that follow me, I had to know what it was like to go through that. And I think a lot of them suffer from that just from their childhood. Being king of the boys and staying king of the boys and not having an experience of being a beta, hmm. I don't think would have given me the compassion to even come out like I am now in favor yeah. for the strong masculine stance that I'm taking. Okay. Uh, I don't think I could do it because I just wouldn't have the compassion. Yeah. I would just be like, what are you, right? a pussy? Yeah. Now I get it. You'll find that almost every single speaker, I think every speaker at this particular conference you're gonna speak at, has had the exact same experience. They've done a lot of very alpha strong things, and they've also made a lot of mistakes. Yep. Uh, that includes me, that includes Socrates, Rolo, all these guys. They've done, we call it like dumb beta shit, but <laughs> it, yeah. however you wanna characterize it, yeah, we make mistakes. And I think through that though, you learn that compassion, that even that empathy. And that's why, uh, like yesterday on the podcast I was on, um, someone was like making fun of like all these betas and stuff, I'm like, you know, that's not the the only problem. The only problem, the only men I don't I really don't like are vichy males that roller calls them like these absolute traitors. If they're not an absolute traitor to their own sex, right. if even if they're beta, even if they're weak, even if they do this, you know, really stupid shit, I've done it. Right. Uh, and through that, I'm able to empathize with that, and I don't I don't have a problem with them because I know they right. can change. Yeah. Right. I know they can make better choices. They can learn. They can go to conferences. They can take action. They can do ballsy, risky, or uh, disciplines. You know, actions, discipline, stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, I like that, the compassion. It's a good way to put it. Yeah, or empathy. Yeah. Empathy, yeah. I kind of get the two confused. But knowing that, knowing how they feel because I've been there. Yeah. And I've, I, and I've become aware of how I was there. Yep. And I can look at my blindness in retrospect. I can, of course, empathy and, and compassion and say, yeah. okay, I don't hate you. I'm not mad at you. I won't judge you or make fun of you. Mm. I know where you are. You're lost, yep. and I won't make any qualms about that. You're, you're not on the right path, 
but there's hope for you. Yeah. Let me show you. Yep. And so now that I, ha- I have a son, <laughs> and uh, he's the youngest. How old is he now? He's eight. Okay. He's the youngest. It's so funny because uh, <laughs> King of the Boys, he's like the, the prince. And, you know, I don't, and I mean that in, he's a mama's boy. Mm. He's got older sisters. Yeah. Those, his sisters are his example. Yeah. Uh, he's <laughs> he's the youngest. He's the baby. He's got three sisters, right? He's got three older sisters. Yeah. He's got a, he's got a mom that loves him like any mom would. And, you know, mom, mommies him, especially because he's the youngest. And yep. so, you know, I'm watching him <laughs> and I'm like, he's, he's got it. He's going to have it tough because hmm. uh, he, he's, he's taking on and he carries a lot of women, foot, female energy. Hmm. And I'm like, thank God that I am his father. Yeah. And that when the time is right, which it's evolving, you know, yeah. you, they go through this stage. All children go through this asexual stage hmm. where it's like, you know, boy or girl, it's like some of the traits show themselves. Like he was clearly masculine. And I knew he was the minute. I never showed him guns or weapons before. I, he just didn't see them. I have them in my home. Uh, he didn't really watch. It. He was too young to be like watching violent things. Hmm. First time he saw a gun, a toy gun at a. We were at a dude ranch, you hmm. know, horse horses and stuff, okay. and they were selling fake guns. And a, a boy had a gun. He didn't know what it was, but all of a sudden he saw a little boy's gun, and he was like a magnet. He's like. Daddy, what is that shooter? Holy Daddy, I want, shit. he saw the kid shooting it. What is that shooter? I want that shooter. And he went over and he was like mesmerized. He called it a shooter. A shooter. Interesting. Yeah. He didn't yeah. know it was a gun. Yeah, I, didn't yeah. have, I didn't have guns. I didn't show him guns. He didn't I have figured, toy guns. He figured it out what it did, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, even, of course, it's been my calling to be the man that I am, the father that I am to the millions of men worldwide. Hmm. But then as my boy is beginning to, around nine years old, Hmm. I think they start moving towards the father. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's pretty consistent that their mama's boys until they get like seven, eight, nine years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. between seven and nine, correct. That's what I'm starting yeah. to experience, starting to move towards me. Yeah, and so it's become really important for me, even more important for me, hmm. to really dissolve the beta stuff yeah. that I was allowing the woman in my home to kind yeah. of weaken me with yeah. <laughs> women, women are, will weak, weaken women are, you they're pretty good at that yeah you know? they're the best and be the bad guy in my home now yeah for my son yeah so that he sees even if he doesn't understand he sees okay mom and all the sisters have this opinion yeah. and they're doing this thing but dad it's strange because he's going the other way just for me to draw that contrast so my son can see there's a difference here yeah. You may you may even still choose to go with your mom and your sisters now, but there'll come a time when you're going to know that you're not a woman. Yeah. And you can't be a woman and they can't save you. Yep. And that remember what dad was doing, remember what dad was saying, remember how he was different. There's another way for you. It's mm. the right way and there'll be no question what it is to be a man. And then he'll rebel. No. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I rebelled against my dad being the king of boys, I think partly because I wanted to be the king. And you were a teenager, 14, 15 or something? Yeah. I could only imagine that because my life seems to be a, in so many ways, contrasts my dad. He Mm -hmm. had three boys. I had three girls. Oh, wow. Youngest was a daughter. Youngest is a son. Mm -hmm. This is wishful thinking. I imagine that there will come a time when he'll naturally push against his mom and the girls and run towards in in the same way I did the opposite. He'll run towards what his dad is doing and it'll be the coolest shit because like, I'm going to be, I'm out there shooting guns with you guys, you know, and he plays, he plays Fortnite and stuff like that. It just comes natural. Uh, I'm out there hunting. I'm doing manly stuff. I lift, always have tough guys coming to my house. I own a gym. Mm. So when it comes a time when he wants to create contrast, as every teenager does, yeah. it'll be like, dude, I've got the greatest contrast here for you. Yeah. Let's go shoot some assault rifles and lift. Fuck yeah. Shark fishing, whatever else we got to do, man. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't yeah. have to force it. One of the things is I realize I don't have to force it. I don't have to make him yeah. be anything. 
would be an option available. That's about, I can imagine that's not only the best way, that's like probably the only effective way to raise a son into an, an alpha, into a masculine man. He has to choose it for himself. Yeah. Before he's on him, he'll definitely just lash out. I mean, it's like, a, you know, you've seen that story play out in movies and stories for who knows how long. Mm -hmm. So I think, you're, I think you're killing it. I think you're in the nail mm -hmm. head. I think yeah. the relationship between my wife and I also too mm -hmm. is very important for him to feel comfortable allowing me to be the alpha father and to be a pattern that he wants to follow. Because if I was living in a home where many fathers and men do, where the woman denigrates the masculinity, yeah. uh, I know my mom did. My mom denigrated my dad's alphaness hmm. in a lot of different overt and subtle, subtle ways. Yeah. She says she doesn't like him, you know, and she's to this day, I'm like, mom, you love every bit of alpha that he is. That's why yep. you're here. Yep. But she pushes, you know. Yeah. If I had a wife that, let me put it this way. Not if I had a different kind of wife. Because I have a wife that embraces the way I am, my mm. masculinity. She praises me in front of the children. Mm. She plays her feminine role in, to such a degree that it highlights my masculinity in the home. Mm. Uh, she, and she, she supports that. And she, you know, I'm, I'm reiterating myself here. It sounds like it, um, it highlights and colorizes almost, like adds color and uh, brightness to the example that you're setting. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. You're setting yeah. an example of what, what, what a male-female relationship should be like, mm -hmm. especially in that particular setting. Yeah, so he yeah. won't, because my wife doesn't resent me as a man, let me put yeah. it that way. A lot of women resent their husbands. Yeah. Because my wife doesn't resent me, my son will feel, hopefully, who knows what's going to happen, yeah. will feel like, oh, even mom upholds and follows dad the way he is. Yep. It's right. Let me go. Well, I'm willing to bet, too, that your wife's relationship with you is an example, uh, not an example. It's a reflection of how she, her relationship with all men. Uh, she, I, I, would, I would be stunned if your wife hated men except you. I'm sure that's the opposite, that she, she respects masculinity and you're setting an example of that in expression and she's embracing it and then mm -hmm. your children are seeing that. Yeah. But it's also, I think, going to inform every parent relationship with their children is going to inform the children like that's what the world is like or should be like. And so you guys are setting that in the home. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. I can't yeah. wait to meet her. Yeah. I'll be bringing her to the convention, uh, Patriarch Convention. Yeah. Yep. Good chance I will. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah you bring the kids too if you want, man. Good chance yeah. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> There's a pool there they would hang, they would love, but other than that, that's prob Maybe. probably for the best. She she likes yeah. to be engaged in my work. Okay. Yeah. And so she's come to a lot of my uh, my grounding camps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She doesn't come any longer, and she respects that boundary. Um, oh, because no you exclude all women now, yeah. Yeah. No, no man. No, but she still <laughs> she still is behind the scenes. Yeah, of course. Um, so the reason why I say probably not is because we'd have well we need to bring someone to mind the kids because yeah. she'd want to be there to watch me speak. And she's all about what you guys are doing. Yeah. So she would be a hundred percent wanting to be there to watch all the other speakers. She'd feel like yeah. she'd be gypped if she had to, you know, go, go. Well, I'll tell you this in the future. Um, your sons are definitely welcome at the convention. We have uh, two or three coming to the event right now this year. They're a little bit older than your son, uh, oh, yeah. 13, 14, 17. Mm -hmm. They come with their fathers to the event. And we had a couple last year too. Drew Bay brought a son, for example. His right. son was like 12 or 13, Luke. Nice. So yeah, yeah definitely. That's a good age. Yeah, that's a good age. Yeah. Eight is a bit young for mm -hmm. our, our content. Oh, yeah. I mean, he so. wouldn't go unless he could bring his Nintendo Switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah. you go. Mainham <laughs> will play. Mainham will kill it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that about wraps up what I wanted to get through with this. It's been awesome having you on the show. Yeah, this has been great, man. One yeah, of my yeah. favorite interviews ever. Fuck, thank, damn. Hell yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah appreciate that. Thank man, I'm, I'm still learning the ropes. I'm usually more the uh, conference, uh, you know, behind the scenes guy, the Wizard of Oz, putting this all together. Mm -hmm. But sitting down with you, it's been really exciting, and it's been, uh, it's been deep, man. Like you, you have, and that's continually why I'm impressed. This, you know, getting to spend time, spend time with you, shooting, fishing, doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like you have a lot more going on than I realized, and uh, it's been, it's been just, you know, a fascinating journey to get to know you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Yeah. So uh, before I forget too, fuck up this part of the interview. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, what's the most important thing? Grounded camp. Uh, to find yeah, out. Grounding Camp is very important because Grounding Camp is my attempt to bring back one of the time-honored traditions mm. that men have always provided for other men. Mm. And that is, <laughs> I use this term lightly and kind of in a joke, but a safe space yeah. for men to be men 
but not just like you've done with the 21 convention. It's a very safe space. I want to honor you for that also too, for creating this safe space Thank you. for men to be men and to talk about manly things. Mm. But initiation has always been a opportunity for life transition, mm. for death and rebirth, for moving into a new phase of life. For change. For change. And change needs context. And that's why the elders and the great initiators always knew that when a young man was reaching that point in his life where change was inevitable, biology sets it in, mm. they would set themselves apart, particularly from society and women, provide some austerity, provide some challenge, yeah. and provide some meaning for them to then proceed in the next part of their life. Right That's what the initiation, rites of passage, mm. process is all about. Mm. It's not something that just happens at puberty. Mm. And I learned that big time uh, between the ages of 36 and 39, my last few years. Okay. Life is constantly initiating you. One of the things I say about grounding camp is that I'm not initiating you. I'm not, it's not that pseudo initiation when you go to college and they, they whip you with the paddle and make you drink yourself to death. Yeah. That's not initiation, that's pseudo initiation. That's a totally different thing that's a part of the old dying patriarch. Yeah. What I'm creating is one of the time honored traditions of the new patriarch and, that is, and that's what Grounding Camp uh, provides. So whether you're 24, I found is criti the critical age for many young men where there's this confusion. Not that I chose that. Mm. I, can put, I can see it logically why that's the case now. Mm. But I began to see, like, why are there all these 24-year-olds around? I don't know They're all 24 years old. Mm. It happens to be one of those markers psych psychosocially yeah. where... But then we're getting a lot of guys in their thir late 30s, 40s, and beyond mm. because it is right for them also to to put down some of the old ways of the past season mm. so that it can refresh. I don't, grounding camp is not about me teaching you what to do in the next phase of your life. Mm. It's about let's destroy our old ego, clean the slate, open ourselves up to be led so that your next phase can be revealed to you. Mm. And that'll come at 36, 49, so on and so forth. So all are welcome. And what a better time to do it, uh, go to a camp like that right now in America uh, than right now with the whole country changing, how fast it is and how, uh, how extreme things have gotten, but also how positive things look. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I could speak for myself and maybe feel the same, that I've never felt this optimistic about the future of my country in my entire life. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have yeah. a president, you know, personally that I'm proud of every day. Yep. More and more so every day, which is even more, uh, what, a, what, a, what a pleasant surprise every day or yeah. a pleasant gift. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's time for change, and I think uh, mm -hmm. I think we're doing that, man. We're you there, man, and we got to be warriors because yeah. the forces of evil will fight back, Damn and right. they're fighting back, and they're losing. If you see all the media yeah. battles, they're screaming with every single dead fly that's yeah. laying around, starting with the uh, Christine Bailey thing. Oh yeah, you know what yeah. a flop. Uh, yep. Up until recently, they had the oh the boys that were wearing the MAGA hat. Yep, what a flop. The yep. the the Smollett thing. What a flop. The entire <laughs> Russian BS where they were trying to go flop. against him, what a flop. They're, they're throwing arrows. They're throwing arrows. They're going to yeah. keep throwing arrows. We have to be stronger than them. We are stronger than them, yeah. but we got to speak up. We got to do work like you're doing, 21 Convention. Thank you. you gotta, if you have a voice, use your voice. Yeah. It's not about going back to the old ways. It's not about the bringing back the old patriarchy. It's about renewing it in this way. And it begins with being warriors, setting those boundaries, and rebuilding this world. Damn straight. Build something better, man. I think that's what you're doing. That's what we're doing. I'm excited to, to work with you at the, the upcoming convention. We're doing it. And yeah. be together in this. That's yeah. another thing. I'm, I'm so glad to be working with you yeah. as another leader because that's the way of the new patriarchy. <laughs> It's not competition. Competition is a way, is a, is a part of the old patriarchy that is dissolving and dying. Mm. We come together, just like nations, America's becoming great again. Yeah. Let our individual businesses and sovereignties and gifts that we give to the world become great and let's work together. Yeah. Because that's how we're going to rise. I call it, uh, with the, team, the speakers especially, I call it teamwork. 
it's a very simple concept. Yeah. You know, I grew up playing sports, I think, like you. Mm-hmm. And I see working with so many content creators is just fundamental teamwork. And we're doing that, you know, with organizations and individuals. Mm-hmm. And that is, I believe, a big part of the future, like you're saying, of a new patriarchy and a masculine future and a better future for this country is teamwork at every level, whether that's like we talked about earlier with uh, different cultures and races and then also, you know, organizations and businesses like this and, you know, individuals. Yep. It's been fucking awesome having you on, man. You Appreciate brother. you. And I'll have you back here soon in Orlando. Sounds great. We'll be, uh, Elliot Hulse will be at the 21 Convention Patri- Patriarch Edition. Yep, be this, there. Hell yeah. That's going on May 3rd to the 5th in Orlando, Florida. You can get tickets on sale now. You could save 25% off getting your ticket now. Tickets are at the21convention.org. That's the21convention.org slash patriarch. There's also going to be a link in the description of this video or anywhere else around it, like a card. And you can go and check that out and visit the event and meet everybody at the conference. It is an incredible experience, everything we do with 21 Convention. Speakers like Elliot, Rolo Tomasi, myself, Hunter Drew, all these guys. Don't miss it. It is the first time we've ever done an entire convention, an entire weekend, focused on fathers, fatherhood, masculinity, marriage, and family. You need to be there. We do plan to repeat it in the future. We'll see how often it happens. But for right now, this is the one and only Patriarch edition of the 21 Convention this May in Orlando, Florida, and I hope to see you there. I appreciate you tuning in. Elliot, thanks again. It's been awesome having you out. And thanks you, thank you for everything you're doing, man, and your whole life and uh, with your entire business. My pleasure.